So let's turn a little bit for the last few minutes of this conversation and talk a little bit about some adjuvant things, some bone health things, and then finally we'll sum it up. Um, I think that the first thing is that this year's uh, ASCO, uh, they presented in a very interesting analysis, to say the least. I'm a very interested post, kind of almost quasi post hoc um, way of combining the data. Now you can tell where I think about these, this combination. Uh, but the text and the soft trial. So I'm curious, and I'll ask the academic guys first, then I'm going to then ask you, Dia, what your opinion of this data is and will you use it. Um, so let's start with Hope. What do you think? of the uh, soft well, I, and text I data. I thought about it a lot because I wrote the editorial for I the know, Wigan that's Journal. That's why I asked you the question. It just came out. Your editorial just came out in the Wigan <laughs> Journal, so I'm very curious to see what you have to yeah. say. But you know, it's an interesting question. They, they, the soft and text trials, you know, I always think of them as text being the more e, EU trial, the more Europe trial. Everybody gets a variant suppression. We should probably suppression. talk about the design. Everybody so. gets a variant suppression. Yeah. It starts with chemo, and if you're going to give chemo, otherwise you just start it and then you randomize to tamoxifen or exemestane. The soft trial was the sort of more U.S. softer version of the trial, and what that was was you randomized patients to either get the standard, which was tamoxifen alone, or to a variant suppression and tamoxifen or exemestane, so a three-arm trial. And the difference of soft and text is that text, you started a variant suppression with chemo, but in soft, you actually had to recover your menses to be eligible. So people had gotten some tamoxifen and waited to see if their menses came back if they were premenopausal and then they were eligible to be randomized on soft. So partway through this, you know, around 2000, they're looking at the data, we're all anxious to see soft in text, right? And particularly soft because of this tamoxifen versus should we give ovarian suppression? And there's no events. How bad, you know, people are doing so well. No, right, no good relapse, for the patient, good bad for the, patients, for the clinical you know? trialists. Right. And so what they did was actually statistically quite valid, which is take two studies that have almost identical study designs, except for that delay in start of ovarian suppression. That's a big, that potentially is a big deal. It's actually not a big deal in, in hormone receptor positive disease. Any other disease subset it would be. Okay. But if you're delaying about, you know, a few months for most patients, the delay was about six months. You, in a disease where 50% of the recurrences are late and you're looking at almost six-year median follow-up, probably that difference is in the noise. You know, we, we can't be 100% sure, but it was a way of salvaging a huge number of patients who were randomized in trials and getting results. So you take this, you throw out the tamoxifen alone arm, which we're waiting anxiously for, and you just look at everybody who got a variant suppression in tamoxifen or exemestane, and there were less recurrences in the patients who got exemestane. But if you try and look at the nitty gritty of this, the patients, and the way I sort of ended up looking at it was instead of looking at node positive or negative, you know, I looked at the people who got chemo and didn't. So, you know, we make decisions on giving chemotherapy. Usually the people we give chemotherapy to have a worse outcome. We're pretty good at deciding, you know, chemo versus not. So you looked at the people who didn't get chemo. They had very few events. They did really well, didn't really make a difference which drug they got. But if you looked at the patients who got chemo, there was a big difference. And the difference existed whether you looked at soft alone or text alone. So my sort of take on home on that is that if you have a patient who has high risk ER positive disease, this is a therapy that should be considered. And you can give them a variant suppression and tamoxifen and then switch them when they're, you know, a little better off after their chemo to the exemestane so you don't get so much side effects at once. The only thing I will say is that the side effects were reported as being essentially equivalent to not bad. That's not my experience in practice. So I don't know if it's that the women on trials don't complain as much or we are just crummy. I think it's probably the latter at accumulating this data. We don't ask about these side effects well. Sexual dysfunction is a big issue for patients and it affects their quality of life tremendously. We have to be asking questions and monitoring that in patients who get this. Do you, would you really have expected a lot of menopausal type of symptoms to be different since they got chemo and they already lost their ovarian function during chemo? I mean, does the ovarian ablation add so much to patients that receive chemo? If they get I can an see AI, if they didn't. I think it does. If they get OS plus AI, it's harder than OS plus TAM, even after chemo, because yes. TAM gives you back some estrogen effect. Mm -hmm. They don't get as much oh, vaginal yeah. dryness, yeah, maybe, you know, yeah. for example. So there was a poster presented, and I'm not sure because I haven't admittedly yet read the entire New England Journal article. I don't know if they presented the this data. Though. Now I will. Editorial. I have my homework. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, <laughs> But right. there was a, a, a poster presented at the same time. On the quality 
this was on the est serum estradiol levels in the women who received dexamestane. So it was a subset analysis of only 90 patients. And they monitored estradiol levels every three months. What percentage of patients had estrogen breakthrough? They were inadequately suppressed. In that study, it was up to 25%. That's right. That's what up people have seen in every single study of that. So we I have to, you. if we're going to be using this in our 30-year-old high-risk patient yep. whose ovaries are still going to be chugging along, we have to be, I think, following serum estradiol levels if we believe that's important as part of the tumor Unless control. Unless we do the ovarian suppression as a oophorectomy. Then we're Absolutely. Okay. Then we're okay. But then maybe that the chemo before was better at maintaining ovarian suppression than if we don't give chemo. But I've had people who got chemo have breakthrough. There's oh, no so question there about 30s, it. Of course. So Absolutely. it's an incredibly important point. My question though is how do you reconcile this with the ABCSZ trial that didn't really show? It was 1800 patients. It was very small. They right. didn't get chemo. So if we we chemo. believe that right. chemo right. plays a role in helping the ovarian suppression so you don't get estrogen synthesis. Okay. Well, that's a good they point. didn't get chemo. And if you look at the subset of patients who did worse on anastrozole, because they all got ovarian suppression, no chemo, and anastrozole or tamoxifen, and then zoledrine or not, which it's Adam will talk it. about, is uh, then you actually, if, when they looked at the subset of patients whose body mass index was over 30, those were the patients who did poorly. And that's a publication that is really important because probably what ended up happening is no chemo, overweight, totally inadequate suppression of the Because they have ovaries. way too much aromatase right. going right. on. Yep. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's a good point. And I think that, you know, that's kind of our way as we're trying to figure that out and reconcile with ABCSG. And we're still waiting for the tamoxifen only arm that will help us reconcile it as well. I'm thinking about that. So, what would make you, what do we need that arm anyways? I'm just playing devil's advocate. Like, <laughs> do you think that tamoxifen alone could be better than ovarian function suppression no, and tamoxifen or XMS? Okay, so what? It could be the same so with so no additional side effects. It no, but if same. it's the same as the tamoxifen ovarian suppression, but the XMS then is better. Ah, good point. So, ah. why would you give tamoxifen alone? Then in a low-risk person, you could just give tamoxifen and feel very comfortable. Right. And then, we we're gonna, right. then we risk stratify. Then we risk stratify, which is what we'll do. But this study was only the high risk patients, correct? No, you no. could so anybody, anybody on. That's well. why it took okay. so long to accrue, and it was there was the, no uh, events because it was everybody. I'm just sure. focusing on the high risk. Yeah, sure. but what, I mean, what do you what we do based on this? What are you and your colleagues going to do now in practice? Well, I think ovarian suppression in premenopausal patients was very important in the high risk patients. I, ideally, we'd want. We're always very very cautious and nervous with a premenopausal patient who uh, who, who does uh, get chemotherapy and, and then tamoxifen, of course, continues to menstruate. Um, and, and then what do we do if we if they, they don't stop menstruating? Do we continue tamoxifen? Of course, do we, uh, uh, do we uh, offer ovarian suppression plus something like an aromatase inhibitor such as exomestane? So I think the, uh, uh, this is a very, very important trial because patients are Really, someone in their 30s or even 40s is really going to think about the side effects and the and the long-term side effects, and uh, we really have to convince the patients that the uh, benefit is worth the uh, the side effects.